All right, well, thanks. Thanks for the, oppor the opportunity to come speak and for being here on an unusual day for the seminar. Um, everything I'm going to be talking about is joint work with John Baldwin. Um, so, just start, uh, I'll give a quick overview of, you know, monopoles and contact invariants and, and related things. So, this all goes back to, I guess, work of um, Taubes in the 90s, which, you know, in which he proved that the cyborg witten invariants of symplectic manifolds are interesting. I guess in particular they're non-zero. So this is for symplectic four manifolds. Um, the idea is what, what are the cyborg witten equations? Well, if we have a four manifold X and I guess a metric on it, then we can take a, I guess it should be equipped with a spin C structure. So usually written S, and usually what that, what that means is we have a pair of rank two Hermitian vector bundles over our manifold X, and we have some notion of um, Clifford multiplication from, it goes from the cotangent bundle of X to the endomorphisms of this, these bundles, S plus, plus S minus, and it's supposed to interchange the two sum ends. It sends S plus to S minus and vice versa. So anyway, give, given this, we have the cyborg witten equations. Um, so you start with a uh, spin C connection on, on your manifold X, and you also start with a, um, I guess you call it phi, a uh, section of, say, the positive spinner bundle. And so given, given this data, given a connection and a spinner, you produce a pair of um, bits of data. So we take w w one, the first one is the self-dual part of the curvature of A minus some quadratic term. You take the spinner, oh, sorry, the spinner phi. You tensor it with phi star, and you take the traceless part of that. And you know maybe there's some perturbation data in there that I won't write down. And then there's also a Dirac operator associated to A, and you apply that to your spinner phi. And roughly speaking, um, you know, there's a lot of sort of stuff that gets swept under the rug here about perturbations and so on, but you can think of the cyborg witten invariant of X in the spin C structure to be, well, the inverse image of 0 and 0. That's the, the kernel of the cyborg witten map. And this gives you a number. And so what Taubes proved, I guess the, this result I mentioned here, is that if x omega is a symplectic manifold, then, well, there's a canonical spin C structure. Um, so we can take S plus, the first half of the spinner bundle, to be lambda 0, 0 plus lambda 0, 2 for some almost complex structure, and S minus lambda 0, 1, so the 0, 1 forms. And then there's, there's a, canonical, um, a canonical monopole, a solution to these equations, where so we have, we have this connection A phi such that, sorry, A phi such that, OK, first of all, um, well, maybe I should just say A comma 1. So, so the spinner we take is 1. It's the, the constant function. It's an element of lambda 0, 0. And there's a unique connection that makes, um, well, so, right. So, phi, so we take phi equals 1. That's sort of an element of lambda 0, 0. That's a spinner. And we take A such that the, um, the derivative of that, let, let me make sure I'm getting everything right here. The derivative of that spinner is 0. So this is a canonical solution. And what he showed is if you perturb the cyborg witten equations, so you take this first equation here, and you add some really large multiple of the symplectic form, then this canonical solution is stable. It doesn't go away. And eventually, when the perturbation gets really large, it's the only solution left. So he showed that you know, the cyborg witten equations, well, the cyborg witten invariant of x in this canonical spin c structure is plus or minus 1. 
And this leads to things like, for example, if you know that the Cybergwitten invariants of a connected sum vanish, as they do when both the sum ends have B plus, I guess, greater than one, then you know that connected sums can't carry symplectic forms. So anyway, this is, this was a natural appearance of, of uh, symplectic geometry in Cybergwitten theory. And, you know, a couple years later, people started talking about, well, this is a four-manifold invariant. What about three manifolds? So if we have a manifold Y, then you can study the Cybergwitten equations on Y times R. And the idea behind monopole flare homology which you know, was developed, I guess, primarily by Kronheimer and Rufka, and in particular, there's a very big book of theirs that works out all the details of the theory. It's a homology theory, so it's, you know, roughly speaking, it's um, generated over some rings, say the integers, by time invariant solutions of the Cybergwitten equations on, on y times r, and the differential it basically counts finite energy uh, monopoles, finite energy solutions. So the picture for that is you have a cylinder. Here's y times r. And if you have a if you have a solution of the Cybergwitten equations with finite energy, then it limits asymptotically to um, two instances on, on either end. Say let's call them alpha and beta. Uh, sorry. It limits the two monopoles on either end, alpha and beta, like this. And so we say that the, you know, the differential of alpha is basically the sum of you know, beta over all of these, all of these um, solutions. So you, you get a homology theory. I mean, there, there are details to be worked out. There, there's in particular, there's a gauge group action. There's tons of symmetry involved. So you have to divide out by that. And then once you do that, maybe the, ga the gauge group action isn't free. There are so-called reducible solutions. So you, you blow up this configuration space, you know, the space of all the connections and spinners. And um, you do, you know, you, you work with this blown up space. You basically do Morse theory for the, the churn simons dirac functional, which is something whose critical points are these time invariant solutions. But you get a homology theory, and it's, it's well defined. And there's actually, so I guess if we write, um, HM2, as it's called, the Y comma S. S is a spin C structure on Y. So this is the, this is the uh, monopole floor homology, or at least one variant of it, of Y in that spin C structure. And as it turns out, based on these ideas of tabs, there's a, a contact class. So if we have a contact structure on Y, then we can actually associate, as Kronheimer and Rufka do, a class they write often by uh, C of, say, Y comma C, it lives in the monopole floor homology of minus Y, so Y with the opposite orientation, and in the spin C structure that's associated to the contact structure. I mean, the, a spin C structure on a three mold, uh, on a three manifold, one way to think of that is as a homology class of non-vanishing plane fields. So you can take something like the Ray vector field, and that's non-vanishing, and that, that determines the spin C structure. And roughly the picture for that is so we take our cylinder minus y times r. Well, it's just y times r at this point, really. We glue on the symplectization. So this is now y times r. And it's got the symplectic form d of e to the s times alpha, where alpha is a contact form. And so what we do is we look at monopoles. Um, look at monopoles on this glued together thing. which on you know, this end here are only finitely far away. So you know, I can say L2 close, and close just means finite distance, to Taubes' monopole, the, to the, cano the canonical solution of the cyber Witten equations on this end. And so we get some element. So we get, um, well, as it turns out, we get this class. It lives in the monopole flare homology of y with um, that spin C structure. And you know there are lots of details to be checked. One is that if you count on the monopoles, and you, so basically you're summing what they approach asymptotically at this end. You have to check that it's a cycle, that its differential is 0. 
and that also it only depends on the contact structure and not the contact form or any data like that. But you actually do get a contact invariant out of this. And it has some nice properties. So for example, it's 0 if C is over twisted. Um, it's non-zero if C is, let's say, Stein fillable. Um, this is, actually, you can strengthen this. It's non-zero if it's symplectically fillable. And if it's weakly symplectically fillable, then with an appropriate set of twisted coefficients, it's still non-zero. So this, this actually gives a proof, you know, not using holomorphic curves, that weakly fillable implies tight for, for contact three manifolds. Um, so th these properties are due to Kronheimer and Rufka. There's also, recently due to Hutchings and Taubes, um, a nice result about its behavior under exact symplectic cobordism, which says roughly, here's a picture of a symplectic cobordism. It's got at the concave end y minus c minus, and at the convex end y plus c plus. Let's call this x omega. And, um, Monopole floor homology is a TQFT. Cobordisms, well, it's roughly a TQFT. Cobordisms induce maps on monopole floor homology. So if we view this sort of not from left to right, but from right to left, so we get a map HM of minus Y plus C plus to HM of minus Y minus C minus. So there's a map associated to this cobordism. And it sends actually the contact class to the contact class if c or if x omega is exact. So for exact cobordisms, the contact class behaves naturally. So these are some nice properties it has. Um, okay, so that that's for closed three manifolds. And I should mention, you know, at the same time in Hagard floor homology, which we now know is um, isomorphic to monopole floor homology, uh, there were analogs of this in general all due to Ojvath and Sabo. They're not defined using monopoles or holomorphic curves or anything. It's more, uh, sort of more combinatorial and it uses in particular the Giroux correspondence between open books and contact structures, which sometimes makes people a little nervous. But we have these groups, so HF plus of minus Y in whatever spin C structure, that has also a contact class. And actually, I guess it's known that the isomorphism from Hegard floor to monopole floor identifies these. This, this is due to Ojvath and Sabo. Um, but then the Hegard floor people went a little further and said, well, closed manifolds are nice, but you know, other manifolds are worth studying too. So back in about 2006, Andras Juhas uh, defined basically Hagard floor homology for sutured manifolds. So these are, these are manifolds, three manifolds with boundary and with some decorations on the boundary. And the standard example, at least you know for an audience like this, the standard example is a contact manifold. So yxc um, with non-empty boundary. And if the boundary is convex, then, well, there's a dividing set on the boundary. And so associated to the choice of three manifold into this dividing set, we have um, sutured floor homology groups and say, you know, we can associate them to y and to, to this dividing set, these curves on the boundary, or to, um, you know, I wrote minus y and minus c. And you can take these and reverse the op orientation. And the reason I do that is because, so we start in this picture with Kronheimer and Rufka. They've got monopole floor homology. There's a contact invariant of closed three manifolds. Then, you know, a little bit after that, Ojvath and Sabo do the same on Hegard floor homology. And now the Hegard floor people push a little further. And Honda, Kazez, and Matic um, 
maybe around 07, 08, they define actually contact invariance for, for these manifolds with boundary. So in this case, there's some class C, C of the contact structure that lives in the sutured floor homology, as it, SFH as it's written, of minus y and minus gamma. And you know, there are a couple reasons you could do this. One is it leads to some nice applications. For example, I wrote that the contact class over here, it vanishes when manifolds are over twisted. It turns out it vanishes when these manifolds have Giroux torsion as well. And one, the, you know, the way this was proved in, in Haggard floor homology was to say, let's take a neighborhood of a piece of Giroux torsion, let's compute the contact class of that, it turns out to be zero. And then they have these gluing maps that say you take a sutured manifold, a manifold with boundary, you glue a piece onto it, and they're actually natural maps corresponding to this gluing that carry the contact class that was zero to the contact class of the new thing. So, you know, once you can embed a bit of Giroux torsion in your manifold, these, these methods show that, um, well, they show that the Giroux torsion always has to kill a contact invariant. So, you know, for example, there's a proof that manifolds with Giroux torsion can't be fillable, at least not strongly fillable. So, um, so we had this, and now I'm sort of doing this in chronological order, which is why it goes back and forth between the two different stories here, Kronheimer and Mufka about Oh, hey, they did the same thing as Andras Juhas did. They, they define monopole and instanton floor homology for sutured manifolds. So for manifolds with boundary. And, you know, to some extent, part of this was just saying, well, this, con this construction works in, in a Haggard floor world. It should work in our floor world as well because the two are the same. But also in the instanton case, this was actually a, uh, an important step in their program to show that, which I'll write as a theorem, that Hilvanov homology detects the unknot. Um, so this wasn't just, you know, for no reason at all. The, you know, the, the motivation was that you can use instanton floor homology for knot complements to associate groups to, to a knot. You find a spectral sequence from Kovana homology to these groups, and that gives you a, a rank inequality so that if you know that you know, these groups, these instanton floor groups for knot complements to detect the unknot, then you know, after another 100 pages or so of work, you get a nice theorem out of it. So anyway, so that, that, that's you know, one of the main motivations. Also. It also led to another proof of the property P conjecture, which says that if um, basically if you take a knot that isn't the unknot and you do any Dane surgery on it, you don't get a homotopy sphere. So this was sort of, you know, like a case of the Poincaré conjecture. Anyway, so using this, using these these homology groups, which you know. I'll, I'll get to in a moment how they're defined and what we do with them. So then the point of this talk is that John Baldwin and I define contact invariance in each of these, in each of these homology theories. So if they're, if they're denoted SHM and SHI for monopole and instanton, um, so we contact invariance in each of these, which are, which are just like in all the other cases, elements of these homology groups. And so we have, we have a number of applications. Um, so one is, you know, similar to these Honda Kazesmatic applications that I mentioned about gluing maps. So say we have some contact manifold with boundary, and it's got a divide, set of dividing curves on that boundary. So maybe here's a picture. Um, well, one thing you can do is, yes? The dividing curves come from, they're, they're actually determined by the contact structure. So, you know, the fact that, the, well, so the boundary is convex, which means that there is a contact vector field transverse to the boundary. 
the dividing curves are exactly where that contact vector field actually lies in the contact plane. And it's known that it splits the boundary in half into a part where the, the vector field points you know, sort of out transversely or in transversely. So, so if we have this manifold, we can glue handles to it. So for example, um, one example of a contact handle is you, you take you know, a pair of points on the dividing set and you just glue like topologically a one handle like that. And this, this changes the dividing curve in a prescribed, the dividing curves in a prescribed way. Um, but you get a new sutured manifold and in fact a new contact manifold with boundary, so M prime gamma prime. And you know, topologically this, this handle, well it's just, it's a ball and you put the usual contact structure on, on the ball, namely the, you know, the, the unique tight one, and this gives you a contact structure on your new manifold with boundary. And so what we have are gluing maps from SHM, the sutured monopole homology of minus M minus gamma, to SHM of minus M prime minus gamma prime to this new manifold that carry our contact class to the, to the new contact class for, for 0, 1, 2, and 3 handles. And, and any handle you could possibly want to glue, we can give you a map that actually takes, um, you know, takes the contact class to the other. And it, it only depends topologically on that map, on you know, the, the gluing data, data for the handle. So you know, taking this same application further, we can talk about gluing bypasses. And a bypass is just the usual picture is half of an overtwisted disk. So if, if this here is gamma on some manifold, and you, on the boundary of some manifold, and you take an arc with n points on gamma on these dividing curves, and that intersects at three times total, one, two, three, like that, then you can glue half a disk on like this, um, sort of transverse. So if you think of this as sitting flat, the disk is you know, sitting straight up. And what this does is it changes the dividing curves to look like this. Um, so it, you know, these two sort of turn around and meet each other, and these two as well. And there's, you know, then this curve here in the middle, it starts in the bottom left and it runs to the top right. That's, that's what changes the dividing, that's what, excuse me, how the dividing curves change when you glue on half an over-twisted disk. And this is actually, it turns out, this can be made into a three-periodic operation on your contact manifold with boundary. So here, here's, a, here's a little piece of the boundary of M. Maybe we've got three dividing curves running through this little disk in the boundary that, run li that look like this. If we attach an arc, like if we attach a bypass along this arc, what this does is it rotates the dividing curves, something like this, according to that operation. And if we can attach another one along this arc, then, well, it rotates it one more time. So we go from now from the bottom to the top and then, uh, wait, sorry, rotated a little too far. Um, like that. Uh, there we go. Then it looks like this. It's sort of rotated on 120 degrees. We attach a third bypass along this arc, and we get actually back to where we started. So, so bypasses give you this three periodic operation. And what we can prove, well, a bypass, this half an over twisted disk, has a nice description in terms of handles. You attach, you attach a one handle along the top part of the boundary, and then you fill in, the, fill in the little hole it creates with a two handle. And so using these maps, we get actually, well, three maps on the sutured homology of, of our manifold Y with these dividing curves. And we get something that you know suggestively looks like a triangle, relating the the invariance of these three different um, dividing sets, and so we get a theorem that says that this is an exact triangle. So it's a useful computational tool 
and um, and this is an analog of something that Kohanda has has been working on in, in Hegard floor homology. He's, there's this contact category, which is supposed to be a triangulated category that you associate. Basically, you take surfaces with decorations. They look like you know the boundaries of these sutured manifolds, and you have these sorts of exact triangles that should make into a triangulated category. And so, so that's been in progress. But we can prove that using the, these maps. Um, so another another thing we get invariance of Legendrian knots and also transverse knots in a three manifold. So the idea is, suppose you have a Legendrian knot. You take out a neighborhood of the knot like this, and it's got, you know, in a standard neighborhood, you can think of the boundary of this neighborhood as being a convex solid torus with a pair of dividing curves. So it looks something like this, and we glue the top to the bottom. And the way these dividing curves are, are, are determined is you think of this torus, you identify opposite sides. So here's a meridional framing and going from left to right and going from top to bottom. We have the contact of the thurston benekin framing. And in that picture, the dividing curves look like that. They, just, they, they point in the direction determined by the contact planes. So what you can do is attach a bypass along, um, along this arc. And what that does, it you know, keeps the manifold the same. You're just gluing on half a disk. But now, gamma prime, the, the, the new dividing curves are exactly horizontal. So you know, the picture of that and the knot complement they just wrap around twice. And so the contact framing depends on the Legendrian knot. The, uh, this meridional framing, on the other hand, is entirely topological. So you get these invariants. After gluing on this bypass, you can think of the contact class of, so you know, y minus the neighborhood of the knot union a bypass. Um, so this is an element of the monopole homology of the knot complement with a pair of meridional sutures. And this is defined to be so-called monopole knot homology minus y comma k of the knot. So this is, this, is an, this is an element now associated to a Legendrian knot inside a homology group that only depends topologically on the knot. And this is, um, so this is due to well, this is an interpretation due to Stipschitz and Verteschi in um, not floor homology, so not Hagard floor homology. It's really this is this is their interpretation in Hagard floor homology of an invariant due to Lisko, Ishbas, Stipschitz, and Sabo, and this is actually a practical invariant um, because it's been reinterpreted in terms of grid diagrams, these, these combinatorial objects, and you can actually com compute it. There are computer programs to compute this invariant combinatorially. So, you know, it's hard to compute monopole invariants combinatorially, things that live in cyber witten theory. But one thing we do have, so a new fact, is that these invariants are well behaved under, so these, these invariants are well behaved under um, Lagrangian concordance. Well behaved So in other words, if you have a concordance between two knots and, you, and it's actually Lagrangian, then there's a map that carries you know this invariant, which I might call script L of K you know. It carries the, the invariant of one end to the invariant of the other end. It's, it's, there's a natural behavior there. And this is totally unknown in Hagard floor homology uh, because there's just no way to interpret this Lagrangian condition. But in monopole floor homology, by appealing to the result that is no longer up here of, of, of Hutchings and Tabs about how the contact class behaves under, under symplectic cobordisms, we can actually prove something like that. 
And the one last thing that I'll mention as an application before I get into the details is we can actually reinterpret our invariant of a manifold of boundary in terms of, and I mentioned, um, I mentioned the Giroux correspondence and that we don't have to use that, but actually we can reinterpret it if we want it in terms of the relative Giroux correspondence and use that to construct it. You know, to give to give an alternate construction of our of our of our um, invariants. So the idea is, if you have a partial open book, so say a partial open book decomposition, because these are manifolds with boundary, and so you need to sort of generalize what it means to be an open book a little more. We can use that to you know explicitly get a new description. of our contact class C, which, as you, which you can actually check is invariant under positive stabilization under, of open books. And this is you know, ordinarily not that exciting, because why would we want to recast this in terms of something that's, you know, that you know, is maybe not 100% proved? Well, it turns out the reason is that this translates you know, word for word once we've done this. It translates into a description of a contact cl class, a contact invariant in sutured instanton homology. The thing I'd written SHI. And so this is actually the first contact invariant that we know of, that you know, nobody's constructed something like this in instanton floor homology. So, you know. It's sort of a more mysterious invariant. You know, anything involving instantons, it's harder to define and compute. And there's no connection, nothing like Cliff Taubes' theorem about the cyborg witten invariants of symplectic manifolds that would lead us to believe that such a class should exist. So this is actually the, the first, as I said, this is you know, the first known contact class in sutured instanton homology. And this leads us to make a very interesting conjecture based on work of Olga Plamanevskaya in Hegard floor homology. So let's say we have a um, rash, no, not rational, an integral homology three sphere, and we can write it as the boundary of some four manifold X. So here's our picture. Um, so so okay, X is a four manifold. Its boundary is Y, and suppose X has two different Stein structures. say J1 and J2, so that C1 of J1 minus C1 of J2 is not torsion in the homology of X. So, so this is supposed to be a Stein manifold in two different ways, and the turn classes differ by something that's not torsion. Then, well, the result of Plamenevskaya says that in Hegard floor homology, when you have this situation, that the, the contact invariants of the two induced spin C the contact structures on the boundary are actually linearly independent in Fleur homology. Um, so in particular, that would tell you the rank is at least two. If we translate that into the instanton setting, then what that tells us is that, well, the rank of the instanton homology is at least two. But you know, in particular, what, it mean, what does it mean when instanton Fleur homology is non-vanishing? We actually get that there's a representation of the fundamental group of Y into SU2. So you know, think of this as like a Poincaré conjecture for these manifolds. But it's even stronger than that. I guess I should say a non-trivial representation. But it's saying that if you have two you know, different enough Stein fillings, then that actually somehow provides an SU2 representation of the fundamental group of Y. And you know, this, at least to me, is a really baffling statement. I have no idea why that should be true, other than you know, all, all the analogies seem to hold up. But you know, we, we have some ideas of maybe how that should be proved, but we haven't done it yet. So that part's, that part's still a conjecture. OK. So now I should say something about how, th how this contact invariant is constructed now that I've you know, hopefully outlined some things it's good for. So suppose we have our manifold y. We have some curves gamma on the boundary. How do we construct 
the sutured monopole homology, first of all. So I'm going to draw this picture of, here, so here, here's our manifold Y. Um, the curves I'm going to draw as living here on the, you know, on this sort of vertical part of the boundary. And they divide the boundary into two regions. One is R plus of gamma, one is R minus of gamma. This is, again, you know, if you think of the dividing curves as coming from a contact structure, and this is where, where the, the um, contact vector field lies in the contact planes, then R plus and R minus are sort of determined by whether it's positively or negatively transverse to them. So, so we have this contact manifold of boundary. So what we do is we take a surface call it T. Maybe we require the genus of T to be at least two. It can be relaxed a little, but that's good enough. And we want there to be a bijection between the boundary components of T and the, the dividing curves, the, the components of gamma. So what we do is we glue on T times an interval. And that's maybe not the best picture of a product. So here, and that's t times i. We glue t times i to our manifold m by sending, uh, sorry, our manifold y, by sending the boundary of t times i to somehow a neighborhood of the dividing curves, the, the, the thing I've drawn vertically here. So we get a manifold. The, um, the top boundary, as I've drawn it here, and the bottom boundary should now be actually connected and diffeomorphic, the reason being that R plus and R minus, they always have the same Euler characteristic in a contact manifold. This is basically the fact that the Euler class of the contact structure vanishes on the boundary. So we get, we get a manifold, I don't know, I'll call it Y0. Boundary of Y0 has two components, and there's you know, some diffeomorphism from one component to the other. So what we do then is we, we glue by this diffeomorphism. So glue R1 to R2 and um, this now gives us a closed manifold, call it Y bar, and inside it a surface R bar that's just the image of one of these surfaces, image of R1. So let me do a quick example. Our, our manifold could have been a ball, for example, just, just a, a disk times an interval with the standard tight contact structure. And then the, um, there's a single dividing curve. It's a circle. So I'm going to draw it like this. So this horizontal curve here is gamma. And on top, we have the positive region. And on bottom, we have the negative region. And so we could say T is maybe a punctured genus 2 surface. So what we do is we glue T times I like this, just sending, you know. So here, here's the boundary of T times an interval. We glue it to this neighborhood of the dividing curve, this vertical part. And what we get is a closed genus 2 surface on top and on the bottom, something like that. So this is what I called y0 here, sigma 2 times an interval. Now, as promised, the top and the bottom, they're diffeomorphic to each other. So we can glue, for example, by the identity map. So that would be something like the identity from a genus 2 surface to itself. We glue by that. And what we get is this closed manifold Y bar is now sigma 2 times S1. And that surface inside it is just one of these genus 2 surfaces. So now the definition of the sutured monopole homology of this manifold is we take this, this manifold and we sum up a whole bunch of its, um, a whole bunch of its monopole, monopole homology groups in different spin C structures. 
we sum over all the ones whose pairing with that, that surface R is twice the genus of R minus 2. Um, these are called top spin C structures because there's an adjunction inequality that says if this pairing were any bigger, the associated groups would vanish. So anyway, the theorem of Kronheimer and Rucka is that this is an invariant of the manifold. Um, of that suture manifold. And, um, and I should mention there's been some other work that I did with, with, uh, with Baldwin where, so Kronheimer and Rufka proved that it's an invariant as a group up to, uh, up to isomorphism. So we proved it's not just up, up to isomorphism, there's some naturality statement. So some notion of naturality for, the, for these groups. Because when we want to talk about elements, we want to define a contact invariant as an element of this group. If you can only pin down the group up to isomorphism, then you know, maybe you're working over a field and now your elements are zero and not zero, and that's it. So anyway, so this is an invariant of the manifold. And the question is, how, how do we define a contact class now associated to the, the contact structure that this manifold carries? So the contact class, well, the idea is uh, we defined the suture homology of this manifold with boundary uh, by embedding, so we, we took our manifold Y with its sutures and we embedded it into this closed manifold Y bar and then you know, took some part of the homology of Y bar. So as long as we're embedding our, our manifold into something closed, we might try to extend a contact structure on Y to some contact structure C bar on this closed manifold and then use the, the contact element that we already have. There's already a contact class in the homology for closed manifolds. So what we would do is we would say let's let um, the contact class of our manifold with boundary be equal to, well, it's going to look like a bit of an abusive notation, but the contact class of y bar and c bar, the, clo the contact structure on the closed manifold. So this is an element of the monopole homology of minus y bar. The sutured monopole homology of minus y or minus gamma. Some so y bar is the closed three manifold that we've embedded it in. We, you know, we had this procedure for like for the, you know, for the the ball. We we glued on this surface times an interval. We glued the top to the bottom to close it up, and then we took some piece of the homology of that. And here, so we're saying, well, why not just try to extend our contact structure in some clever way to this closed manifold? The sutured monopole homology lives inside the monopole homology of the closed manifold. So if we if we do things right, then this will just be an element of that, that sutured group. Okay. So, yes. Well, it, it takes work to show that it's canonical because you know we have these natural isomorphisms between different choices of closing things up and we need to you know we need to show that these isomorphisms preserve the contact class and you know the right naturality statement is not that we get canonical isomorphisms we get canonical isomorphisms up to multiplication by a unit so this contact class is you know basically well defined up to multiplication by a unit but that's sort of okay because there is not in existence an application of any of these three dimensional floor homology theories where like you can say this element is one and this is minus one therefore they're different i don't know if it's because there's no there just is no situation like that, or if it's because nobody's, you know, been really, really careful enough to find one. So anyway, how do we construct this contact class C bar? So I'm going to take the drawing over there. So let's say we had a three ball. It comes with a contact structure that gives us, on the boundary, here, here's our curve gamma, or dividing curve, and it splits it in half like that. 
And what we're going to do is, so we, we need to figure out a way to put a contact structure on this, this extra part here, this t, t cross i that we glue in, so that things glue up, to, glue up to give us a contact structure. And the basic idea is going to be something like the following. So we take, we take some arc, and some non-separating arc in the surface, so it has to have positive genus. And we take little fingers that reach out from that arc to each component of the boundary, something like this. And if we thicken that up, what we do is we get some codimension zero piece on the boundary of, um, on, well, some, some codimension zero part of T that's, I guess, properly embedded. It, will, it, it goes all the way out to the boundary. And what this does, you can think of the boundary of this. So let's call this green region A. So then boundary of A sits inside of T um, as a properly embedded curve. So what we do is we take, take an I invariant contact structure, vertically invariant contact structure, with dividing curves the, exactly that boundary of A. And so, uh, I don't know if people can see clearly, but you can draw these red curves that sort of reach around the boundary. And that, so there's, there's an I-invariant contact structure with exactly those dividing curves. And we can declare that maybe this is the negative region of, of that surface T, and that the outside is a positive region. So once we do that, this, is, this gives us, it gives us a contact structure and we can set it up. So that if we, so now we can, we can set up that diffeomorphism so we had going from the boundary of this thing to, um, to a neighborhood of the sutures, which lived on, you know, on the boundary of M, so that the dividing curves line up. And you know, Giroux showed that the, basically knowing the dividing set on a, on a um, convex surface inside a three-manifold, that uniquely determines the contact structure on some neighborhood of it, up to isotopy. So now we can glue. And when we do, we, we, we get a contact structure on that intermediate piece, on that intermediate piece that I guess I was calling Y0. So in the example of the Darboux ball, so we had a genus 2 surface, Y0, sigma 2 times I. And up to isotopy, really, the, the positive region, it, it's extending it out to the boundary is only useful for setting up the gluing construction. The important part is that it retracts onto this, this annulus here. And what that amounts to pictorially is that the dividing curves on, say, sigma 2 times 0 are just this pair of parallel non-separating curves, this gamma here. And actually, the same thing turns out to be true on the bottom. Um, so now, what now what we have is we, can, we need to pick H from you know, the top part, it's R1, this is R1 on top here, this is R2 on the bottom. We can always pick a diffeomorphism, so the, the dividing curves on each of these surfaces are a pair of parallel non-separating curves. So we can, we can take H, that gluing diffeomorphism, to send gamma 1 to gamma 2, to send these two curves here to these two curves there, and again, because the dividing curves determine the contact structure in a neighborhood of the surface, this actually gives us a contact structure C bar on that closed manifold Y bar that we got at the end, uh, at, the, you know, at the end of this construction. So, so on this example, uh, which I guess I just erased, on this example, um, so we started with a Darboux standard contact structure, and we got our closed manifold was sigma 2 times a circle, genus 2 surface times a circle, so that, that was y bar 
um, the surface R bar was uh, one of those surfaces, sigma 2 times a point. And the contact structure we get is actually something S1 invariant now. If we picked our gluing map to be the identity, you know, the contact structure on this piece was I invariant. We glue the top to the bottom by the obvious thing. We get something S1 invariant. And now, so like I said, we let the contact class of our original manifold with boundary just be the contact class of Y bar and C bar, this closed thing. And um, in this case, so in this case, um, this S1 invariant contact structure is weakly fillable. This, there, there was a weak filling of it constructed by Chris Wendell. And if we, you know, if we work with the right system of twisted coefficients, you know, we, we basically fill by the, the Poincare dual of the symplectic form of this, we, sorry, twist by the Poincare dual of the symplectic form of this filling. What that tells us is the contact class is non-zero for y c equals the Darboux ball. So that's an example of how we construct this contact class. And um, you know, we have to be able to do one example to show that it's not always zero. Okay, so now in the you know the little time I have left, I should say something about I the idea of why this is an invariant. So I'm going to focus on that choice of gluing diffeomorphism H. So suppose we have two choices of gluing maps. Say H and H prime. Then we can write, well, we can write the difference between them, say H prime inverse composed with H, as a product of Dane twists. Um, so, so plus or minus one. So, so, so these twists tau c are supposed to be Dane twists along um, along curves c that live inside that surface r bar inside our manifold. So we you know, we cut it open, we glue back by some Dane twist along this curve c. And we can arrange, since the gluing map is supposed to fix the dividing curves, we can arrange that, that the curves C do not intersect those dividing curves. OK, so then, since, since these don't intersect the dividing curves by you know, using some general facts about contact three manifolds, we can actually we can actually make these curves C Legendrian. And then the Dane twists, um, they basically correspond to, I guess, a plus or minus one Dane twist corresponds to a minus or plus one contact surgery along the Legendrian curve C. So once you do that, Once you do that, then actually it turns out, you know, the, these surgeries, well, they, you know, they carry the contact class to, you know, the alternative contact class, you know, C prime, uh, sorry, I guess I'm just calling these C. So they carry what we thought was the contact class for one set of, one closed manifold to the contact class for the other closed manifold because Legendrian surgeries preserve the contact class because they correspond to you know, attaching Weinstein handles. And two is they actually induce isomorphisms. And in fact, these, these are the natural isomorphisms that I mentioned earlier on the sutured monopole homology of you know, minus y minus gamma. So you know, these are the isomorphisms that carry the contact class to contact class. So that shows that it doesn't actually depend on this gluing mass. OK. Um, I want, you know, there was another choice, well, the other big choice that comes up here is the genus of this surface T. And we can show it doesn't depend on that, but I, I won't say why for lack of time. Um, I just want to mention 
give you a quick idea of what the handle attaching maps look like. And I'm going to illustrate this in the simplest case, which is that of attaching a one handle. So the picture is, here's our manifold M gamma. It's got maybe two, par two parts of the boundary. Dividing curves run through it vertically. And M prime and gamma prime, the, the manifold we get by attaching a handle, now looks something like uh, this. So we, we attach this topological one handle. And the dividing curves, well, you know, they get cut off by the feet of the one handle. They just run across it, something like this. So that's what it looks like to attach a one handle. And there's a very natural map that we can construct corresponding to this that sends the contact class to the contact class. Namely, we, I claim it's basically the identity map. So claim um, there's a map from the monopole homology of minus y. Well, now I called it m, so maybe I'll just minus m minus gamma to SHM of minus m prime, this new manifold minus gamma prime. It's an isomorphism, and it sends the contact class to the contact class. And the proof is very simple once you've set this up. So let's take, let's take our closed manifold y bar prime c bar prime as a contact manifold for, the, for this guy on the right here, m prime gamma prime. So one way to do it is to say, so so here's what our manifold looks like. It's got dividing curves that run along the handle like this. So what we can do is we can take our surface T and just sort of drop it in in the most obvious way possible. So T just gets glued, you know, there's a piece of T that gets glued to this dividing curve. There's another piece of T that gets glued to this dividing curve. And we use this to somehow construct a closed manifold. But this actually gives us a closed manifold as well for our, our original manifold without the handles. Namely, here it is. There's, there's m gamma. The one handles are running along it. And now the, the, this auxiliary piece t that we drop in here, it just sort of absorbs the handle. Now, instead of you know, one piece coming in from top and one from the bottom and meeting this handle in the middle, we just say that you know, t basically is one big piece that like, absorbs what the handle used to be. So this, this is a way of constructing a closed manifold. Again, you know. We glue in a thickened T times I. We glue top to bottom. But this picture here basically shows that we can glue in you know, whatever surface T in each case so that the closed manifold we get is just the same on the nose. You know, we glue in T times I. We get the same manifold in either picture. The contact structures are the same. So this map in this particular picture is really just the identity. And so th there's a nice interpretation as well of two handles. They correspond to contact surgeries, but that takes a little more effort to you know, draw and set up. So I won't. I won't go into that, but thank you for your time. Thank you very much.